Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Rigo, and I'm the Director of Health Transformation at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. I would like to welcome you to today's interactive webinar, Achieving a Strong Evidence Base for Sustainable Community Health Worker Program. Today's webinar is the final webinar in our Community Health Worker Call Series that is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. The objectives for today's webinar are to develop a broad understanding of the current status of CHW evaluation, understand health outcomes CHWs help to accomplish and how they are accomplished, become familiar with a national initiative intended to identify common process and outcome indicators for CHW practice, and to identify and reflect on the tasks and action steps that participants can apply in their own settings. We have an esteemed panel of experts that will be speaking with you today. Following my introductions, we will have a quick brainstorm question followed by a series of presentations and an interactive Q&A session with our experts. If you have a question, you are welcome to post it in the chat box on your screen at any time during the webinar. These questions will be used during the Q&A after today's presentation. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to inform us about the work you are doing related to community health workers and to provide us with feedback on today's webinar. We look forward to hearing about your efforts. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Noel Wiggins is the founder and director of the Community Capacitation Center at the Multnomah County Health Department. Dr. Wiggins has 30 years experience training, supervising, creating policy, and conducting research with and about CHWs. More recently, she served as a consultant to the CHW Health Disparities Initiative of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. In addition, she is an appointed member of the Traditional Health Worker Commission of the Oregon Health Authority and co-founder of the Oregon CHW Association. Currently, she co-directs the CHW Common Indicators Initiative with Dr. Edith Kiefer and other colleagues. Dr. Edith Kiefer is a professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan, where she conducts community-based participatory research addressing health and healthcare disparities. She has extensive experience planning, conducting, and analyzing data from longitudinal epidemiological studies, qualitative formative research, and intervention research studies in community and healthcare settings, including randomized clinical trials. Dr. Kiefer is a founding member of the Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance, where she promotes sustainability of CHW programs and careers through policy change and workforce development. Dr. Terry Mason is an experienced public health and policy researcher and advocate based in Boston, Massachusetts. Over the past decade, she has specialized in policy research and development to support organizations working largely at the state level to advance integration of CHWs into health systems. As Deputy Director for Program of Policy Research at the Massachusetts Public Health Association, Dr. Mason co-led a collaborative policy committee on CHWs which led the successful grassroots campaign to pass legislation establishing a Department of Public Health based Board of Certification of CHWs. Dr. Mason also represented the Massachusetts Public Health Association on the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Commissioner Convened CHW Advisory Council. Leticia Rodriguez Garcia is a community health worker currently pursuing her master's in public health at Portland State University. Prior to pursuing her master's, she worked at Benton County Health Department with families from traditionally underserved and underrepresented communities. She engaged in advocacy for health services and resources and facilitated resource navigation with families. Buddy has served as the graduate research assistant for the Oregon CHW Consortium for the past year. She is also a member of the Education and Training Committee within the Oregon CHW Association. So as you can see, we have a steam panel of experts who will be speaking with you today. And now I'd like to turn it over to Noelle Wiggins, who will um, conduct the first polling question. Noelle? Thank you, Kristen. Good morning to those of you on my side of the country, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. I'd like to thank ASTO and HRSA 
for inviting me to be part of this webinar to talk and learn about a subject that is very close to my heart, conducting evaluation with and about community health workers. In our webinar today, to the extent possible, we're going to be using a philosophy and methodology known as popular or people's education. Popular education is based on a number of principles, one of them being that we learn more when we're actively involved. It's a bit challenging to use popular education in a webinar, but we're going to do our best. In order to get you all involved, we're going to ask you to share, via the box on your screen, one pressing question you have about CHW evaluation. If you're participating in the webinar with others, you may want to come up with a question altogether. I will give you a minute or two right now to write down your question. Okay, thank you all very much for quickly writing down a great list of questions. Right now, I'm going to read some questions that were posted. We won't answer them all now, but they will guide our presentations during the webinar. And we'll discuss as many as we can during the question and answer period. So a few of the questions that I'm seeing are, I'd like to know about sustainability models and care coordination. Another question I'm seeing is uh, just a general question about documentation needs. There's a question about how to minimize reporting burdens while still obtaining useful data. That's a great question. There's a question about how do you measure the true number of CHWs within a community? I see a question about best practices for program evaluation. We will be talking about that shortly. I see a question, for CHWs, promotoras, who are involved in research activities, and I can't see the rest of the question. Ah, here we go. Uh, let's see. JJ, could you, can you see the rest of that question? Okay, we may need to come back to that one. I see a question about yeah, what is your favorite is... one? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, JJ. Sorry, I can't. I can't. You're right. Okay, no worries. Okay, the next one is, what is the return on investment for community health worker programs? And here's a question about how to evaluate authenticity to the model. That's a great question as well. So thank you all so much for that list of great questions. I'm going to move now to the next slide. So I'd like to proceed now to my next responsibility during this webinar which is to provide a brief introduction to the history and current status of CHW evaluation. Many of you have probably played a game called Two Truths and a Lie. I'm going to modify that game slightly and begin with three truths and one misconception about CHW evaluation. First, as many of you know, historically community health worker programs have lacked stable funding, and unfortunately, the vast majority still do. It's also true that the lack of stable funding for programs has impeded our ability to conduct rigorous research and evaluation about community health worker programs. And there's also been a lack of funding for the evaluation component themselves. For both of these reasons, and this is the third truth, community health worker researchers and evaluators have been largely unable to conduct the kind of multi-site, longitudinal studies 
that are needed to firmly establish the evidence base for programs and models. So all those things are true. What's not true, however, is that there is a lack of research and evaluation about the CHW model. In the next few slides, I'll try to show you what I mean. So on Sunday, I did a quick literature search for the term community health worker using the Medline database from 1964 to the present. As many of you know, community health workers have gone by many titles, and Medline combines those titles under the heading of community health worker. As you can see, between 1964 and 73, my search pulled up only 14 citations, and many of those used the term aid to refer to the community health worker. Over the next 10 years, the number of citations climbed to 146, with the majority coming from the developing world. The total citations for the periods 1984 to 1993, 1994 to 2003 are similar at around 250. But during the following 10 years, which includes the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, the number skyrockets to 864. And in just the last two and a half years, the number of citations is almost 600. So my point here is that we have over 50 years of research about community health workers, and the body of research has increased significantly in recent years. As you can see on this slide, research and evaluation about community health workers has covered a wide range of health outcomes, from diabetes to heart disease and, more recently, to health inequities and the social determinants of health. Even more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that there are now enough studies about community health workers to warrant a number of systematic literature reviews. There are more than what are shown on the screen. I've only listed some of the most well-known here. The most recent, by Kim et al., was a review of CHW interventions to improve chronic disease management and care that appeared in the April issue of the American Journal of Public Health. I think another sign of the increasing credibility of community health worker research and evaluation is that a number of respected academic journals have dedicated whole issues to the community health worker field. A few of them are shown here. Before I pass the virtual baton to Edie, I'll close by highlighting a few current trends. The first is that while many researchers continue to study the impact of community health worker interventions on outcomes like social support, empowerment, and health status, there has been an increase in the measurement of outcomes that are relevant to the health services sector, such as the utilization of health services and return on investment. The second is an increase in methodological rigor, with more and more researchers, like our colleague Edie, conducting randomized control trials of community health worker interventions. There continues to be a need for long-term funding to conduct those elusive multi-site longitudinal studies and, as both Edie and Lefty will discuss shortly, there's a gap that we are attempting to fill for a set of common process and outcome indicators so that results can be aggregated at multiple levels. And finally, happily, there is growing realization that it's crucially important to involve community health workers as equal partners in evaluation and research and to support community health workers to become the next generation of community health worker researchers and evaluators. And with that, I'll turn it over to Edie. Good afternoon, and thanks, Noel. Since the 1990s, um, Detroit Health Social and community-based organizations and the University of Michigan colleagues have been using community-based participatory research approaches to address diabetes and its risk factors in southwest and east side Detroit. Community health workers have been involved in formative research to identify community issues, needs, and strengths, and to participate in developing and conducting the resulting interventions. As research and evaluation team members, community health workers have participated in planning and conducting process evaluations, helping to interpret outcome evaluation findings, and to disseminate the results. Today I'll provide some brief examples of our work with the REACH Detroit Partnership and Healthy Mothers on the Move, or Healthy Moms. 
these uh, projects are two community health worker centered randomized control trials affiliated with the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center. The Reach Detroit, oops, I don't think I, excuse me just a minute. <laughs> I went the wrong way. All right, the REACH Detroit Partnership was founded in 1999 with a CDC REACH grant, Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. Community Health and Social Services, otherwise known as CHAS, a federally qualified health center and URC partner in Southwest Detroit, served as a central coordinating organization for the first phase of our work and the host organization and often prime grantee during all three phases. In all of these phases, community health workers were the heart of the interventions, and I would add the soul. During phase one, we conducted linked community, social support, and health system and individual level interventions. Um, we conducted pre-post evaluation of outcomes among participants with type 2 diabetes, and at the community level, recognizing that you can't expect people to modify their behavior or change their ability to affect their disease management without having adequate community resources and activities that they can participate in. So we worked at developing some of these with great success, including what's now an ongoing um, community produce market and community-based physical activity. During phase two of the project that had NIH funding, uh, we conducted a, a randomized control trial with a delayed intervention control group. By phase three, we had moved to um, conducting a much larger scale randomized control trial with an enhanced usual care control group, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that one in a, in a few minutes. What was common in all three phases was uh, the Journey to Health or Camina a la Salud intervention um, that was community health worker driven and conducted. Its goals were to increase diabetes self-management, increase physical activity and healthy eating, enhance individual family provider relationships, increase access to community resources, and importantly, increase the healthcare consumer skills of participants in the project. Um, in all phases of the project, or at this point, um, everyone in the project was uh, served also by a health system or federally qualified uh, partner organization. And that's kind of an important distinction from some projects. We, uh, for various reasons, decided that people needed to have a health care provider as well as a community health worker. Uh, so they had to be in a primary care setting as well. Excuse me, I need to advance this. Okay, so in our journey to health intervention, community health workers link participants with community resources and services that address the social determinants of They help participants develop health-related and other goals, and they provide an 11-session individual and group education uh, set of meetings. They also provide social support through home visits and telephone calls, as well as accompany participants to clinic visits as long as the participants are interested in having that happen. The, the community health workers are trained in empowerment approaches to build participant capacity and self-efficacy. During phase one, we conducted physician act education activities with health system partners, but otherwise the intervention was not specifically integrated within the health care received by participants. During the third phase of our project, uh, we conducted a rigorous, we, we had a more rigorous design. I should have mentioned in a second ago that in during phase one, our community steering committee had advanced recommended that we advance to our RCT model in hopes of strengthening the evidence base for community interventions. And they decided that it was OK to randomize as long as we uh, eventually provided the intervention, the full intervention, to the people in the control group. Um, this was important for building the case for long-term sustainability. By phase three, they had actually decided we could go ahead and proceed with a more rigorous design. Uh, in which the control group re received the usual health care that they received every 
from their primary care provider, as well as a two-hour group education session led by a research assistant to discuss the meaning of anthropometric and lab test results. We conducted outcome evaluation at baseline at, and six and 12 months following the six-month long intervention. We conducted this with 222 participants comparing the community health worker intervention to enhanced usual care. During this phase, we also added a peer leader component to the randomized control trial with a second randomization that took place after six months of the intervention. The peers were former REACH Detroit participants who were specially trained to provide peer leadership and kept in contact with participants after the CHW intervention concluded. And I will say this is pretty important because one of the concerns in the CHW literature has been the inability to determine whether there's a longer term impact of the intervention. It's also important to emphasize that the peers were trained by the CHWs. Uh, we, we use linear mixed models to estimate the average pre-post intervention changes within and between the community health worker intervention only, the CHW intervention plus peers, and the enhanced usual care groups. And our Reach Detroit studies have actually consistently shown, including this trial but also the other ones, that participants achieved significantly improved blood sugar control, diabetes related to stress, distress improved, and depressive symptoms improved. Uh, in, in addition, diabetes related knowledge and self-management and knowledge and efficacy also improved among participants in the CHW groups compared to the intervention groups. And I'm trying to advance the slide and I'm having, uh, okay, there it is, sorry, okay. Um, an important feature of what we are doing is that because we believe in the importance of dissemination and CHW involvement in this process, we also, uh, community health workers have been involved in all phases of conducting process evaluation and discussing the implications and the meaning of the results of the outcome evaluation that, that we conduct. We, they also have been incredibly important parts of community dissemination. We've done this through reports as, uh, as well as focus groups and community discussions. And our steering committee, as I mentioned, improved all, approved all phases of our, of our designs. This is one group at a, at a dissemination activity. Um, I am not sure if I flashed by the slide, but I will say that because of the success of our partnership, our FQHC host organization task center decided to integrate community health workers into their ongoing care. Because CHWs are still not sustainable in Michigan for the most part, CHAS sought and received funding from the National Center for Healthcare Reform to evaluate the impact of CHW integrated patient care teams on quality of care and health outcomes. And we have a multi-phase um, Intervent evaluation that we're currently planning to look at all aspects of uh, the process of integration of care teams, including whether referrals were successfully uh, made, whether people actually received the services that they were referred to, how effective we were in meeting um, client needs. We'll be also looking at healthcare use and satisfaction with CHWs in their care, in addition to clinical outcomes and a return on investment analysis. I hope I still have a few minutes to talk about Healthy Moms. This is another um, randomized control trial that we conducted in the same communities um, at about the same time of, as the birth of REACH Detroit Partnership. We were also building on the results of HRSA and CDC funded studies on perinatal health and the physical activity, nutrition, weight, and diabetes related beliefs and practices of pregnant and postpartum Latinas and African American women. Let's hear it. These, hello? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. These studies were also uh, designed with a community based steering committee, and we, they included longitudinal data collection as well as in depth individual and focus group interviews that build, built on their, each other to help design the intervention and plan what became Healthy Mothers on the Move. Because community people were involved in all phases of this planning process, one of the main things they told us was that the program should be led by women like us. 
which is, of course, community health workers. So they were at the heart of this project as well. A little bit about Healthy Moms. I'm going to quickly move through this. This was also funded by NIH. It was one of the earliest translation um, studies of the Diabetes Prevention Program. And the aim was to increase the proportion of women who eat healthfully and are able to exercise regularly um, in, to achieve a reduction in risk factors for type 2 diabetes. We also had a process aimed which CHWs were very involved with, which had to do with documenting what, what we were doing so that we could sustain this if it was successful. The content was um, delivered by community health workers in 10 uh, group meetings and 10 weekly optional activity days during pregnancy and uh, during one-on-one -on -one home visits. The control group uh, received actually very high quality um, pregnancy education during four sessions in a group meeting by a community-based mental health care and uh, infant health care provider. There were 278 women equally randomized between intervention and control. Uh, we called them women's health advocates, our community health workers, and they were community resident women who provided social support, home visits, and the trained facilitation of the curriculum that I just mentioned. We also, as I mentioned, had optional activity days that gave a less structured opportunity to learn by doing. Uh, often planned by the women who were participating. This included exercise, food demonstrations, and a lot of social interaction. And the intervention was conducted at trained community organization host sites, who also hosted our data collection processes. And importantly, I think in terms of success, where transportation and child care were provided. And I will add that that's a challenge for sustainability for most uh, organizations that don't have a grant. Um, our effects, um, I think later in this you'll be receiving a, a reference list. So these are published studies uh, both for both Reach Detroit and Healthy Moms. But we were able to improve um, dietary outcomes, um, both improved consumption and de decreased consumption, depending on what you're looking at. And you can um, look at these hopefully in, in more detail later. Um, so we had successful outcomes in that regard. And very importantly, uh, because the women in the planning phase were really telling us that one of their biggest issues was feeling um, trapped in their homes, depressed, um, really lacking in social support, was uh, that the intervention significantly reduced depressive symptom scores uh, during pregnancy. And then after pregnancy, especially in non-English speaking pregnant and postpartum Latinas, we saw a continuing intervention effect. Um, in reducing depressive symptoms postpartum. So that is essentially the end of my um, the end of my presentation at this stage. And I think if there are questions, we have time later uh, for those questions. So thank you very much. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Edie. And this is Terry Mason. I'm going to pick up here, although. Um, Hmm, my computer seems to have malfunctioned just, just at this very moment. Hold on one second. Uh, I can't advance it. Kristen, can you advance it? Yep, I'm happy to. I, I can get this slide there. on the screen. Now. There it goes. I think I can do it now, but in any case. So um, I, I really do think it would be important, since uh, we are talking at you a lot, um, to give you a second to respond and you know give us some thoughts um, that you might have in reaction to these first very interesting uh, presentations. Um, the overview of where the field is and uh, where it's going, very rough, uh, and Edie's really interesting studies that she described. So I want to ask um, how many people you know sort of raise your hand or say something uh, if you were surprised at the number of studies uh, that, that are out there of community health worker interventions. If you, uh, you can only do this by your um, little chat, but I'd love to hear anyone's response to that. Some raised hands. So they were surprised. Some people were surprised. A number of people were surprised. Um, why do you think you're surprised, and why do you think a lot of policymakers and others think that there is so little evidence about community health workers? This is harder to do with a raised hand, but if someone has a um, 
an explanation of that handy, it would be interesting to hear it. Uh, if not, I can give my own. Um, but it is something that's true, that we do hear that all the time. Um, and it looks as though, from, from my perspective in any case, that some of this has to do with simple uh, disconnect. There has the dissemination in the circles, perhaps, that we're most trying to, to talk with these days, which are health providers and payers. Uh, may simply not be exposed to this research. Perhaps it hasn't been gathered together enough in an accessible manner. And another um, thing I think is that, um, well, I think those are two for now, but maybe we can talk about some others later. Um, and does, uh, let me ask you a, a yes and no. Maybe this is easier to say. Um, well, can people make a comment, Kristen? Just the chat. Sorry, there's a lot of people are actually responding to the your second question in the chat box right now. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm looking at the wrong thing, I guess. Okay, let's see what they're saying. I want to hear their explanations and not mine. Maybe you can read them if you don't mind. Sure, I can read Here. some of them. Um, so the first is um, they're surprised and pleased policymakers are more likely to hear evidence related to costs and may more, may be more likely to hear from other professional groups. Um, potential employers of CHWs are not motivated to look up the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think policymakers have a place to find this research. It should be gathered in one place. I believe that there is very little evidence because not all CHWs are involved in the data collection. It comes from the researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, research doesn't align with their interests, which is um, or return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, I think policymakers and others don't think there is a rigorous study of research because their perception of CHW, their perception of the CHW profession, um, and there's. Several more. I don't know if you want me to okay, keep that's, going. That's, or? that's funny. Those are very interesting. Okay. I'm, glad, I'm glad you figured out how to do that. I'm going to ask you to read the answers to the next one as well. Um, sure. And that is, uh, people asked, several people asked about best practices um, in, in evaluation for community health worker interventions or programs. Uh, and I think that Edie's study certainly identified a number of those. And I would um, be interested to see if people picked up on some of those best practices. And then we can just uh, read them off according to what people suggested. What are some good and interesting aspects of the studies that, that Edie described that struck you? And Kristen, it's going to be on you to read them. Okay. So some responses are just coming in. Um, the rigor and delving into various protocols. Um, I love having the CHWs involved in the dissemination of results. Um, incorporation of methods to assess long-term impact of CHW interventions. Uh, some things the evidence may not apply in a variety of settings, i.e. urban to rural, uh, public health to outpatient dialysis. Uh, Another response is community linkages. Mm -hmm. um, having uh, have CHWs engaged in the evaluation plan and data collection. Um, some two. people work with CHWs without knowing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then um, another is the assumption that availability and dissemination of evidence is a gold standard element of policy making is false. Um, the black magic and gold dust that epistemic and political uses of evidence tools and po public health policy making from Stewart and Smith, which is a study published in 2016. Uh, okay, I, I think that's, that'll do. Hello? Okay. Um, thanks for that. The, is there an echo going on? Okay. So, um, yeah, those are terrific, and I think um, they answer you guys have answered some of the questions that, that some of you have already posed about best practices. I'll talk very briefly because I want you to hear the last presenters talk about a really exciting project now that will address a, a really uh, important 
uh, missing piece in the, the community health worker um, evaluation and research field. But for now, I'll just highlight a few areas that uh, I think some of which will identify some best practices. Certainly, they identify some weaknesses uh, that have been um, talked about a lot in terms of research in the community health worker field. Because my task is to just sort of highlight some of the evaluation issues in the current environment, and we all know what the current environment really means, which is the tremendously disproportionate influence of health reform and changing financing and um, the entire way that health care is delivered and how it affects public health and a whole range of other areas that community health workers work in. Um, so that's the environment that I'm thinking about uh, when, I, when I highlight these multiple purposes of evaluation research. Um, and they'll just frame what I have to say very briefly. Of course, we all know that you want to improve interventions. That's what evaluation is about. Um, it's not always uh, attended to as much as it is it should be, but it is really crucial. Uh, of course, another uh, important um, purpose uh, of evaluation in, in the context that we're talking about is to make sure that we can demonstrate what community health workers contribute to, to positive health outcomes and costs and other kinds of outcomes. And thirdly, of course, you know, the big elephant in the room, which is making the case to um, the decision makers, whoever has the power over financing and integrating community health workers into health systems so that they can be sustainably financed. Uh, so those are the three major purposes that I will address. Um, the first one, and this will highlight some, some best practices, um, just as ED studies really exemplified, and you'll hear more about in the next presentation. So, You've got to document the process uh, of imp implementing interventions, um, and for a variety of reasons, uh, it's not just about outcomes. It's about how you do it, what community health workers are doing, what everyone is doing, what the challenges are. You want to make sure you're paying attention to the quality and the fidelity to the, the model that you're uh, implementing, and of course, increasingly, there's an emphasis on accountability. You know, what are what are community health workers doing? What are any of the people that are new new kinds of staff or interventions? Uh, doing. So ED studies have done that beautifully and made them a central part of what they're doing. And of course, one of the reasons that this is important also is because it helps you identify best practices for implementation. And this is what those of us who are, who are working in uh, communicating findings to um, decision makers, it's really important. They, everybody wants to know, providers in particular, how do we do this? How is this done? How do we get this kind of outcome? Uh, and then, of course, the other reason to really pay attention to documenting um, and you know evaluating your your inter your implementation is because uh, otherwise your outcomes are going to be shaky, and this is really crucial. Implementation is crucial to to positive outcomes. If community health workers are pulled off the job or not used appropriately or not supervised well, it will show badly on community health workers, and it does not necessarily have to do with what they're doing, but rather the implementation. I think everybody knows examples of that. And demonstrating community health worker contributions to outcomes, again, I think Edie has described some really excellent ways of doing that. But what has, we've all heard a million times is that a very common weakness of evaluations uh, that have been out there um, have to do with insufficient information about community health workers, how you recruited them, how you, what criteria you used to hire them, you know, what kind of training they had, what kind of activities did they do. And it's uh, amazing how many studies you'll see that don't even really give you much of a sense of what community health workers did. So providers and others see those and they say, well, I don't know how to replicate this evaluation or this study, rather, or this, this intervention. Uh, another aspect of demonstrating community health worker contributions to outcomes, and again, ED's studies are really exemplary here. Uh, which is you want to look at intermediate outcomes. Uh, community health workers definitely influence, um, you know, bio health biomarkers, which are certainly important to pay attention to, you know, the health status indicators. But there are many other things that they speak directly to that their activities uh, really are aimed at, which are precursors to the health changes. And um, that includes, of course, um, in, in, you know, and these are examples that I give that are common in, in research, and um, Edie mentioned at least one or two of them. And that's improved patient knowledge of asthma triggers, use of asthma medications, one example that's very common, increased client empowerment, engagement in self-care, that's another very important measure that's common um, about community health worker contributions, enhanced individual and family provider relationships, ED study is an example there, and finally, 
you know, the big, elusive, you know, contribution of community health workers to addressing social determinants of health. Uh, the Common Indicators Project has uh, identified, you know, it's important to describe whether folks get uh, access to food, water, and security. That's a, a definite important intermediate outcome or ultimate outcome, in fact. Um, so then moving quickly into the third uh, piece of this, which is making the case for integrating community health workers and getting them covered sustainably. As we say, the audience at this point is increasingly healthcare payers and providers. And fortunately, it's important to note that there's a common overlap between the measures that are sensitive to what community health workers do and the quality and performance measures that health providers and payers like Medicaid are increasingly accountable for. So for example, um, here are some areas of, of uh, common overlap. Uh, improved appropriate use of asthma medication, and that's a very common measure um, of quality around the country, and it's also very commonly been um, shown to be affected by community health workers, home visitors, and so on. Improved rates of breast cervical cancer screening, improved um, A1C control for diabetes patients, timely prenatal care. There are a number of others, but this is a really important area of convergence to pay attention to in evaluation. And then, of course, there's the cost issue. And we need to go, someone asked about how you do this, and we're not going to get there in this um, presentation, although there are plenty of cost effectiveness and, and cost uh, benefit and return on investment studies out there if, if uh, perhaps HRSA or, or ASTA will post some of those for people to look at as resources. But this is very important, and the most common areas for short-term savings at any rate uh, for community health workers' contributions to outcomes that have to do with costs, as most of you know, are about changing health care utilization patterns, reduced emergency room, you know, lower readmission rates. Uh, there are other areas where cost savings can be directly a result of community health workers, like fewer patient no-shows, fewer patient loss to care. Uh, but there is a major caution here, and I think the Edie's presentation and, and everyone's presentation here today and the next presentations are going to speak to this, and that is the risk that the outcomes will be overly defined by medical systems um, and at the expense of other kinds of outcomes and processes that are important both to patients and to, to communities. And so uh, some best practices is to look at how Edie's studies uh, paid attention to those very clearly and, in fact, grew a lot of their measures and their outcomes out of the concerns um, in the community and, in fact, design their intervention out of those concerns. Uh, and so finally, this, the leading into the discussion of the Common Indicators Project um, is another major critique, which is that we've all heard it, you know, how do you make uh, evaluation studies of community health workers be more consistent? They're all measuring different things. You can't compare them. You can't do systematic reviews by aggregating results. They're all too different. So a major exciting project who's coming up with a solution for this is called the Common Indicators Project, University of Michigan, the uh, Portland State University, and let's see if I get it right, the Community Capacitation Center uh, are all involved with this, both Portland and Michigan, and um, you'll be learning a lot about it from the next speakers. Ready? I think Edie will go first. And sorry. Will go okay, sorry. I had to get myself off mute. <laughs> so thank you again uh, for my colleagues. Um, so just a little bit about the Common Indicators Project. We were hoping to fill what we considered, as mentioned, an evaluation knowledge gap by identifying or going through a process of attempting to identify and develop common evaluation indicators, most specifically of community health workers. Hi, Edie. This is You're kind of breaking up a little bit. Oh, dear. And I'm, I'm speaking now directly into my phone. Can you hear me? Yes. It sounds good right now. We'll let okay. you know. Okay. Thanks. So this, this knowledge gap, we were attempting to fill it by um, trying to figure out how to capture the unique contributions of community health workers to successful programs and document the added value that they bring to healthcare and human service systems. We, our first step was to conduct a literature review to try to identify studies that included measures of how 
HWs contribute to successful outcomes, and we found very little. We saw a lot of recommendations to such studies, but we found very little, very few studies <laughs> done. We conducted um, in Michigan, we tried to tackle this by conducting nine key informant interviews with uh, CHW evaluation experts from around the country. We also conducted three Michigan-based focus groups with community health workers. And I would add that the focus group guides were designed with community health workers involved in the process. And then we conducted um, surveys of Michigan-based community health worker programs. So what did we find? Um, and this, this is very general at this point. But in general, the CHW focus group participants emphasized the importance of social support, meeting people where they are, listening, and empowerment and health promotion as what makes them unique in terms of what they do and how they contribute to successful programs. Interestingly, the key informant experts mostly focused on tasks. They listed things like health promotion activities, system navigation, uh, but they did also mention that empowerment was an important um, characteristic of CHW uh, programs and people. The program survey respondents emphasized trust and interpersonal relationships, satisfaction with the CHW relationship, and the importance of social support. So peer emotional and tangible support provided by community health workers. So basically the things that we felt there was the most agreement on were the ability of community health workers to establish and maintain rapport with their clients, whether they were individuals, families, or communities, and the, their being specifically members of communities who work in communities. Um, and I think at this point um, I want to say that what we tr we tried to do in addition when we wrote this little proposal to do this work was we were hoping and we expressed this hope that this would lead or contribute to building a national effort to develop and advance the use of common CHW evaluation indicators to foster stronger cross-site CHW evaluation and help build the case for sustainability. So the invitation to the CHW Common Indicator Summit in Oregon was a wonderful development that we really appreciated. It allowed this work to continue, and Letty is going to talk more about that work, where it, what happened then and what's happening next. Thank you. Thank you, Edie. Yes, so as the previous speakers have highlighted the importance and the need for common process and outcome indicators, in order to achieve that more systematic evaluation, which allows for those process um, and outcomes of uh, the unique contributions of CHWs to be aggregated. Um, therefore, building on the work conducted by Michua, um, sorry about that. Therefore, building on the work conducted by, by Michua, the staff of the Commun Community Capacitation Center of the Multnomah County Health Department and the Oregon Community Health Workers Consortium at Portland State University hosted a two-day summit here in Portland last October. And as Edie mentioned earlier, with the goal of developing common process and outcome indicators that all CHW programs in the U.S., regardless of setting, um, would measure. And so the, I just want to highlight that the Common Indicator Summit here in Oregon was possible by grants from the Cambia Health Foundation and Social Ventures Partners of, of Portland. The summit brought together 16 community health workers, researchers, and evaluators and program staff from five different states. And as Noel mentioned earlier about popular education, this was definitely the philosophy and the methodology for the summit, which meant that the facilitators made an effort to create an atmosphere of trust, balanced participation, and power around the room, therefore actively seeking input from everyone in the room. I also want to highlight that the facilitation of the summit was also shared amongst the group members while engaging in various popular education methods, such as dinamicas, or as you might know them as movement building activities, a negotiation of group agreements, small group activities, and group evaluation. And so the first day of the summit um, ended with a review of the potential common process and outcome indicators based on a summary of the results of the MITCHFA program evaluation survey, 
which was completed by the summit participants before attending the summit. Um, and then the second day was focused on reviewing the indicators, discussing possible additions with an emphasis on the importance of measuring social determinants of health in the practice and policy context in which PHWs work. This process of, of reviewing and discussing continued throughout the day, um, and this led to the list of proposed process and outcome indicators, which I will share with you in just a couple minutes. And so at the end of the second day, the, the group also created an action plan for continuing the work of the common indicators. And the group proposed and agreed that E.D. Kiefer and Noel Wiggins, who are also um, the speakers in this session, um, could direct the common indicators group. Again, because the goal of the common indicators is that all PHW programs in the U.S., regardless of setting, will measure this indicator. It has been very crucial that the group engages in various opportunities to further develop the common indicators. And so I will share some of the things that we are currently doing and are planning on doing to continue gaining input from community health workers, um, community health worker evaluators, researchers, and anyone interested in the project. So the group, the common indicators group, has monthly conference calls. And that started off with the participants that attended the summit, but has now grown to include 30 or more community health workers, researchers, and evaluators, and program staff from seven different states. Also, um, last, last week, um, we gained input on the proposed indicators from some Oregon experts here um, in Oregon uh, during the Oregon Community Health Worker Association conference. Um, where we had about 36 uh, community health workers and evaluators and community health worker staff attending our session um, and give us very, very useful input on those. Um, one of the things that the community health worker, the Common Indicators Group is working on right now is planning a pre-conference workshop for APHA. And so the title of the workshop is Developing Common Evaluation Measures to Sustain Community Health Worker Programs. I will talk a little bit more about that um, and give you more information in just the next couple of slides. So you will see here um, the process, the proposed process indicators. I was going to ask the audience to read them aloud, but I, I think that may not be possible. And so I will just read them to you. I want to highlight that, as you will notice, that the indicators are categorized into three different sections. So workshop, workforce, capacitation and support, referrals made, and CHW involvement in decision and policy making process. So under workforce, capacitation and support, we have level of support that organization provides for community health workers, value of community health workers to the organization, and acceptance of community health workers, frequency of enactment of the 10 core roles, and then under referrals made, community health worker facilitated connection at all levels, community health worker connections to resources, organizations, and policy makers. Under community health worker involvement in decision and policy making process, we have extent to which community health worker team teams with others in the system, including organizations and policy-making bodies, extent to which community health workers are integrated into healthcare teams, and lastly, extent of involvement of community health workers in decision-making process. And now I would like to show you the proposed outcome indicators. So there's 10 of them, and I, I'm going to read them just in case someone's just on the phone and not. Um, able to view these. So participant quality of life and life satisfaction, participant or household and or household food security, participant and or household water security, participant and or household transportation security, participant and or household access to health and social services, participant knowledge, attitudes and behaviors, Participant and or household social support. Participant psychological empowerment. Participant civic engagement. 
and community health worker satisfaction. And so I really wanted to share these with you all so you could um, see what, what is this list of proposed indicators that came from the summit. Um, but next I will, you're probably wondering, how can I get involved? How can I learn more? And so now I will share with you some things that are coming up that we hope that you can join. Um, first off, we would like to um, invite you all and ask you to share with your colleagues, especially community health workers, and those interested in or have experience in community health worker programs, documentation, evaluation, um, or research to join us at our pre-conference session on October 29th from the session is scheduled from 1 to 5. And as I mentioned, it, the title of it is Developing Common Evaluation Measures to Sustain Community Health Worker Programs. And so participants in this workshop will be given the opportunity to contribute to developing national consensus throughout facilitated dialogue and brainstorming. Um, the dialogue will focus on identifying the definition for each indicator, what and how to measure, identifying gaps on the proposed indicators, and also um, discussion around any issues or concerns with any of the indicators. We also hope that you can join us for two presentations that my colleagues on the phone, Edie and Noel, will be leading along with other colleagues from the Common Indicators Group. And so the first presentation, um, Developing Common Community Health Worker Program Evaluation Indicators, Methods and Results of the Community Health Worker Common Indicator Program Evaluation Survey will describe the participatory development and implementation of a survey of the Michigan Community Health Worker Programs by the Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance and um, identifying and developing community health worker program evaluation indicators by programs in Michigan. And then the next one, which is developing common community health worker program evaluation indicators, development and facilitation of a summit to advance identification of common indicators for community health worker program evaluation um, will describe the process followed by the Oregon Community Health Worker Consortium to develop and conduct the summit in advance of identifying the common indicators. So I know you heard a little bit from me about it, but these, for myself and Edie, but these presentations will really give you um, more in-depth details about the process for each. So, and just to kind of, you may be asking, well, what's gonna be after that? And so um, the group, so after the, conference workshop at APHA, the group will reconvene um, to identify next steps, you know, based on the feedback that we gain from the session. And now I will turn it over to Kristen for the Q&A session. Great, thanks, Letty, and thank you to Noelle, Edie, Terry, and, and again to Letty for the very informative, engaging presentation. Uh, we will now open up the Q&A to participants, so if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box located on your screen. And I think to, to start this off, um, if it's okay with our presenters, I might go back to some of the questions that were asked um, during the very first polling question at the beginning of the webinar. Um, and I guess we'll start with Noelle, but if others want to join or, or provide feedback on any of the questions, please um, feel free to chime in. Um, the first question is, um, how are others aligning global policy systems and environmental change initiatives with CHW efforts? Could you repeat that question? This is Terry. It's not, not very clear to me. Maybe repeat it. Sure. Um, how are others aligning global policy systems and environmental change initiatives with CHW efforts? Does anyone else want to take a stab at that? This is Terry. So this is Noelle, and I really can't say much. What I can say is that um, I know that those PSC changes are increasingly being discussed within our own health department, but I am not aware of specific efforts to align those with community health worker programs. 
I think that's a great suggestion and something that we should probably talk about more. Thank you. Okay, and then we've had a couple of questions um, come in since we opened up the Q&A and um, a lot of questions about how um, to get involved. So um, how can participants on today's webinar sign up to participate um, in the presentations I think that Letty, you, you were describing um, and are there, similarly, are there ways to participate if, uh, if participants are not going to APHA in some of the presentations that you described? This is Leticia. So, Kristen, I'm actually wondering if uh, we are able to distribute um, some information to the participants in the session. I'm thinking about an email that I have which links to the presentations so you know when they're happening, but also to register for the APHA pre-conference workshop. Are we able to send that to participants via the listserv for this session? Yeah, absolutely. You can, if you want to forward that information to me, I can um, send it out in the post-meeting um, emails that will be sent to all registrants of the today's webinar. Perfect. So I will send that to you and also in regards to being involved in the conversation if you are not attending APHA, um, I will also share my contact information and I can follow up um, with those individuals as far as involvement in the, in the group and in the conversations around the common indicators. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you have any CHW education programs involved in the common indicators project? So this is Noel. Um, I can uh, give a first answer. So um, the Community Capacitation Center, which is uh, one of the groups involved in the Oregon Community Health Worker Consortium Research Team, um, one of the activities that we conduct is training for community health workers. We uh, were the first program in Oregon uh, to have our curriculum approved by the Oregon Health Authority and participation in our training does qualify community health workers for certification in the state of Oregon. So that is one example of participation of education and training programs in the Common Indicators Project. Um, there are other people involved in the project who are also involved in community health worker training and education. I hope that responds to your question. Hey, thanks, Noel. Um, and then this, I'm not sure if any of the presenters can speak to this. But there's a question about if there will be um, similar discussions or a similar forum, I think, to in reference to the APHA forum at the American Evaluation Association Conference. I don't know if any of our presenters are planning anything for that conference. Uh, this is Edie. Yeah, this is Edie Kiefer. Um, Caitlin Allen, who is one of the people that's involved in our um, Common Indicators Project, will be doing a presentation at the uh, AEA meeting about, about some of this work. Um, there isn't any active pre-conference or in-depth activity involved at this point that I know of. It's just a presentation. So it would probably give it will be giving um, some of the information, but it possibly in a little more depth about the processes we used to conduct the summit, but it's not an in-depth um, exploration. This is Terry. Um, Kristen, is, is it possible for me to just pull out a question? I think it would be interesting to, to hear the response to. There are a number of them there. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them. Is that yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Well, uh, one question is, and, and so I would pose it to the team, um, what are some examples of how you'd like to see the process and outcome indicators used? Uh, and I assume that's uh, referring to the specific process and outcome indicators that you guys have identified as part of the Common Indicators Project. So this is Noel. Um, I can make a first uh, intent at answering that question. Um, I think that ideally we hope that eventually this set of process and outcome indicators will be adopted very widely um, by community health worker programs that are based 
in uh, a variety of settings, from health care settings to public health departments to community-based organizations. Um, and part of the, the next phase of our process will be <clears throat> gaining broader input on the indicators from um, exactly those stakeholders, um, and also including community health worker associations around the country. So I think one thing we're hoping for is, is very broad uptake of the indicators and then a connection to those settings so that the information gathered can be aggregated. Sounds good. Okay, so we have quite a number of questions coming in. Um, so thank you everyone for your for sending in the questions. Um, we'll continue to move down um, and see. Um, the next question, how does a person's job title, um, i.e. CHW or care coordinator or patient navigator impact sustainability? I don't know if, um, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. No, this is Kristen. Go ahead, Terry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question to interpret, but I, I think maybe what the questioner means is um, that whether it makes a difference if someone is, a, is labeled a patient navigator versus a community health worker uh, in terms of affecting the outcomes. I'm not sure that that ever makes any difference. It really mostly depends on what what specifically people are doing, and you know, and how the model is designed, and and all of that. So, I guess my simple answer would be I don't think it makes any difference what you're called. It's more about what you're doing and and how you're prepared to do it, and so on. Terry, this is Noel. No, go ahead, Lexi. Can you repeat the question one more time, Kristen? Sure. How does a person's job title, um, for example, community health worker or care coordinator or patient navigator, impact sustainability? So this is what you see, I guess, I and just from my experience, I mean, you know, when I worked at Benton County, I was the health navigator, not necessarily to the job title of community health worker, but for me, um, it also, in addition to what um, was already mentioned by Terry, also the community health worker supervision, the, the training that the supervisor has in order to foster the growth and um, of the community health worker and allowing them to participate in, let's say, the, the 10 core roles that were mentioned earlier. And so I, I also just want to say that the kind of the value that's given to the community health worker from the program staff um, has more impact on sustainability than necessarily the job title, and also how other members in the team view the community health worker. So this is Noelle, and I definitely agree with what both Terry and Letty have said. Um, I think that historically, the lack of a common title for community health workers has been one of the things that has impeded the sustainability of the field um, because, for one thing, it has impeded um, the organization of community health workers to advance their profession. Um, and that was one of the reasons that in the mid-1990s, community health workers from around the country who were coming together at conferences um, after uh, multiple discussions over many years um, decided to come together around the title of community health worker and use it as an umbrella title, um, despite the fact that in their own communities they will continue to use whatever title has the most um, relevance. But that was part of the reason for the coalescing around the community health worker title was to promote the sustainability of the field. Great, right, thanks. Um, the next question is, um, since these studies are working with hard to reach populations, what are the best strategies to engage the participants in evaluation? Well, 
Well, this is Terry. I'll just speak briefly to that. I'm sure my colleagues have plenty to say, but um, having been involved in evaluations of community-based programs for a number of years in the past, uh, and community health workers, in my experience, were always really important in being able to engage participants in any kind of evaluation that was happening. Um, they were pretty crucial in that process. So. Um, how they do that or how they did that, I, I, I would only say, you know, the way that community health workers engage uh, people in, um, in interventions or any other work they do. Um, they do outreach and, and they build on their trust and their relationships to, um, to, to uh, engage patients in, you know, giving their views about programs and so on. This is Edie. Um, I would agree um, with, with that comment. Um, I think it's trickier as, as one of the people I think who submitted a question. When it's a grant funded project, there's usually a funded evaluation of some kind and there's often incentives um, provided for completing evaluation um, activities. And of course that's not sustainable in an ongoing um, clinical or community setting. Um, we have had some ex valuable experience with community health workers encouraging their uh, the people they work with to um, you know kind of raising their consciousness about the importance of evaluation to the ability to receive services. It's a tricky fine line. I think somebody made a comment about ethics. Um, it's really important that people that are responding to an evaluation request realize that the results are not going to be made available with their name on it <laughs> to the community health worker. And so it's how you communicate that, um, you know, I think involves a lot about the trust and the, the relationship with the organization that's hosting the activities. We've had good luck, but I think it is, it, we have to be very careful when you're doing that. Totally agree. This is Terry. Hey, thanks, Terry and Edie. Um, the next question is, do you think that the CI project is relevant to community leaders who do not work in healthcare settings, public health departments, or community-based organizations, uh, such as volunteers, parents from low-resource communities who are passionate about serving their community? So this is Noelle, and I would say, I certainly hope so, um, and I think that the feeling of those of us who've been involved in the project so far is that we've really been trying to identify indicators that are the most meaningful um, in communities most affected by inequities and that are meaningful to community health workers themselves and are the things that community health workers identify as how they know that meaningful change is happening in communities. So I would say I hope that they would be relevant for um, community members who are passionate about serving our community in a variety of organizations and settings. Um, this is Edie and I'll, I'll add that I do tend to be trying to be an optimist, um, maybe overly optimistic, but I do feel that one of the um, reasons why we're doing this is because we want to be able to actually prove the case in healthcare settings, but make the case of the importance of social determinants of health and the role of um, community health workers in, in addressing those. So that one of the reasons we're doing this is to make the, the, both the specific case in healthcare settings, using that as a model to broaden it out to the rest of human services and other kinds of activities in communities that are equally or more important in, in health. Um, I think there's, again, I sound like a Pollyanna a little bit, but I think there is a growing recognition that health services cannot be defined specifically only as medical services and that what goes on in housing and transportation and um, a variety of other things that happen in communities are all part of health and health care. And I think there is a growing recognition of this and if we can do a good job of measuring, we'll be in a much better position of making the case more broadly.
Great. Thanks, Noel and Edie. Um, the next question here, um, how do you balance workforce security versus the role of the CHW as an advocate who works with the system but with some autonomy? For example, if healthcare systems hire CHWs, there is some concern that the CHW will be appropriated and lose his or her ability to advocate for patients or community members. That's a big, important question. This is Terry. Uh, I'm going to bow to my colleagues on that. <laughs> well, so this is Noel. I agree. It's a really important question, and I think that, you know. That dilemma is a real dilemma that can be resolved in, well, maybe not resolved. It can be dealt with in a variety of ways. Um, one of the models that we're experimenting with here in Oregon um, is a model that's being developed under the auspices of the Oregon Community Health Worker Association, or ORCHWA, uh, which is called the Warriors of Wellness. And that model um, is it's an intent to develop a model through which in our Oregon terminology, co coordinated care organizations, which are sort of like accountable care organizations, but not exactly, um, those coordinated care organizations can obtain the services of community health workers who are employed in culturally specific community-based organizations by contracting through ORCHWA. And one of the reasons behind that model is um, our belief that there are some advantages to community health workers um, being based in culturally specific community-based organizations. Um, and one of those is the one that you're speaking to, which is um, the ability to retain more autonomy from the healthcare system and also to be supported in maintaining um, cultural worldviews and approaches to health. This is Terry. I'll say something really briefly in case one of my other colleagues wants to say uh, something. But, you know, I mean, what's really important at a kind of a general advocacy level, I think, um, it to, to as one way of dealing with that, that tension, that, that dilemma that community health workers face in not being appropriated by the healthcare system is to continually advocate uh, on behalf of community health workers' distinctiveness and how their very distinctiveness uh, and their very professionalism and their their you know particular training and orientation uh, will bring about more successful um, outcomes and help the health systems reach their goals rather than um, just plugging them into the system and may and forcing them to fit the system rather than the other way around and one colleague talks about this, Heidi Bafua says community health workers are have systems changing potential rather than, um, and that is of course a buzzword at the moment in the health system, uh, so that why would you try to make them be more like the system that you're trying to change and that they can play a very key role in changing. And this is Lippy, and I just wanted to add, uh, to me, you know, it's one of the importance of having here in Oregon, the Oregon Community Health Worker Association because it allows that platform for community health workers to come together, advocate for each other, but also here in our association there's the different teams and so, for example, the education and training team, which um, I just recently joined and uh, having the opportunity for community health workers to share with the health systems, you know, this is what we do, this is the unique contributions that we bring, this is why the programs are successful. So just having such platforms I think is very important. Great, thanks so much. Um, so the next question is, are there examples of pre and post CHW intervention evaluation methods? So this is Noel. I guess I'll speak to a very simple one. I think there are pre and post models. There's a whole range of pre and post models. Um, but just to speak to a really simple one that we're using in a couple of our programs that does incorporate um, many of the indicators that we've identified, 
um, in several of our programs, we use pre and post questionnaires, which um, measure change in a number of uh, variables, including um, empowerment and social support and health knowledge. So those three um, are three from our list of common indicators that we're measuring with a fairly simple pre and post questionnaire um, that's conducted uh, early on in the relationship with the community member and then um, usually six months afterwards and every six months after that. Great, hey, thanks Noelle. Um, another question that's come in is, how can we use the data to reflect and support the distinction between the skills of CHWs and CNAs, et cetera? Say that can one more time. Yeah. <laughs> sure. How can we use the data to reflect and support the distinction between the skills of community health workers and certified nursing assistants or, or other similar um, professions? Mm. So I Noel, guess, go ahead. No, go ahead, Noel. <laughs> no, I was going to say I'll start, and then I want to hear my colleagues' answer. I mean, I think that's a large part of what we're trying to do with the process indicators in the yeah. Common Indicators Project, and this is something that I want to hear Edie speak to this because she speaks to it really compellingly. That part of what we're trying to do with the process indicators is um, make clearer exactly what it is that community health workers do that is so unique and valuable. So I'm going to stop and ask Edie to continue. I think it's the same thing as I would have said. Um, I mean, I, I don't, to, it, so there's core roles of community health workers and I think that's another resource that could be made available to people that might not have, it, have them that have been commonly defined defined with a large in my opinion pretty distinguishable very distinguishable from something like is providing things Edie, like you sorry you're breaking up a little bit it's hard to hear your uh, response probably, probably I'm pausing I think to think I, I think of CMAs as having a a specific role that's often involved in patient care. In other words, direct uh, hands-on, doing blood pressures, taking weights. I'm sure there are other things they do, but those are pretty from the core roles of community health workers. So number one, it's important to have a common understanding of what those core roles are and then measure the, the, fa the fact and the ways in which they do those things. And so I hope that helps answer the question beyond, I mean, it's similar to Noel's response, but I think I want to just emphasize those uh, 10 core roles. And, and, and the yeah. Go ahead, Letty. And I was just going to add to that, uh, also emphasizing the fact that, you know, community health workers are part of this conversation about developing these process and outcome indicators because we are the ones doing the work. So just to share that as well. Okay, great. So we have a few more minutes left for questions. We'll try to see if we can get through the questions that have come in. Um, the next question I have queued up is, what are some examples of how you'd like to see the process and outcomes indicators used? That was the, that was the question I, I raised earlier. Oh, sorry. I didn't see a flag. Okay. Um, there's so many questions. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess, okay, this question came up a couple of times. Are there conversations regarding standardizing CHW education? So this is Noelle. There definitely are lots of those conversations um, happening in different ways in different places. Um, here in Oregon, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's actually been a process developed for approving community health worker training curricula um, and the rules for approval um, require the inclusion of certain topics 
in training curricula. And then there is a format that um, training programs complete and they send we send in our curricula and those are those are passed through a review process um, that is intended to um, prepare community health workers um, building on their own existing knowledge and skills from their life experience. And that's an initial certification curriculum. Um, and this is Terry. In, in many states, certainly in Massachusetts, um, in New Mexico, in other states, there, wherever the certification process is, is beginning to take hold or gets put in place, uh, the question of whether you're standardizing by, by requiring a standardized curriculum versus just uh, defining the field better more clearly by defining what well has been talking about is and um, and e as core roles or core competencies that that's a range of meanings about standardization and so in the case of Massachusetts the 10 core competencies that the board of certification for community health workers came up with through a very open process um, will be required if you want to become a certified community health worker or if you just want to take the core competency training you don't have to be certified. That is a kind of way of putting some parameters on what the core competences of the field are. But it's not the same as having requiring a standardized curriculum, just that certain areas community health workers need to be trained in to be certified or have the core competencies. Okay, great. And I, I think we'll wrap up with this last question, um, and maybe we can just have a quick answer um, from the from the speakers. Of, do you believe that funding streams from CDC, HRSA, OMH, um, and for specific funding for you know chronic diseases, artificially divides the workforce of CHWs and impedes the meta analysis of CHW studies? Impedes the meta-analysis of CHW studies. Ah. Oh. So this is Edie at the risk of I don't know who's on the call. <laughs> I mean, I I think sort of balkanization of funding is a is impedes a lot of things. Um, I think if the funders uh, could potentially work together to say we're going to look at some of these things across programs um, across disease categories and with a more sustainable funding base that's longer term, I think we could move forward in a lot more efficient ways. I, I just can't say enough about the frustration that many of us feel that we're chasing grant after grant after grant. We're conducting evaluation after evaluation after evaluation and there's almost no ability to put all these things together. So yeah, I would make I don't know if this is what was being asked, but I feel like, number one, if the Common Indicators Project kind of activity is going to move forward, I think we need money. Right now we've been doing this just on kind of a, everybody's love of what's happening, but there's, there needs to be coordination as more people get involved. And number two, yes, I think there's a real need to, to end the divisions between the different categories and try to say what what kind of uh, potential research program could we look at across different disease categories and areas of funding and, and finally make a stronger case. And that would lend itself to meta-analysis, absolutely. Here, here. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Edie, for that final question. So with that, we will end today's Q&A. If you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to tap them into the chat box now, and we can make sure that uh, the, the presenters receive the questions and can try to respond back to you um, offline. But thank you again for joining us today. As was mentioned earlier, you will be immediately directed to an evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey as it provides us with useful information for our future projects. 
I would like to thank HRSA for sponsoring this webinar, and I would also like to thank our wonderful speakers, Noel Wiggins, Edie Kiefer, Terry Mason, and Letty Rodriguez-Garcia. A recording of today's webinar will be available on our website within the next few days, and the web address is on your screen now. We hope that you will use this webinar as a resource, and we'll share the link with others once it is available. Also, please visit AFSO's website to access a number of other CHW resources. If you have any follow-up questions about today's webinar, please feel free to contact me, Kristen Rigo at K-R-E-G-O at AFSO.org. Um, and thank you again, and enjoy the rest of your day.